This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 14. The February Revolution. In Russia, the Bolsheviki, known as the Communist Party, are in control of the government. The revolution of October 1917 put them in power. That revolution was the most important event in the world since the French Revolution in 1789 through 1793. It was even greater than the latter because it went much deeper to the rock bottom of society. The French Revolution sought to establish political freedom and equality, believing that it would thereby also secure brotherhood and welfare for all. It was a mighty step in advance on the road to progress, and it ultimately changed the entire political face of Europe. It abolished the monarchy in France, established a republic, and gave the death blow to feudalism, to the absolute rule of the church and the nobility. It influenced every country on the continent along progressive lines, and helped to further democratic sentiment throughout Europe. But fundamentally, it altered nothing. It was a political revolution to secure political rights and liberties. It did secure them. France is a democracy today, and the motto, Liberty, Brotherhood, Equality, is written on every prison building. But it did not free man from exploitation and oppression. And that is, after all, the thing that is needed most. The French Revolution put the middle classes, the bourgeoisie, into the government in place of the aristocracy and nobility. It gave certain constitutional rights to the farmer and worker, who until then were mere serfs. But the power of the bourgeoisie, its industrial mastery, made the farmer its abject dependent and turned the city worker into a wage slave. It could not be otherwise, because liberty is an empty sound, as long as you are kept in bondage economically. As I have pointed out before, freedom means that you have the right to do a certain thing, but if you have no opportunity to do it, that right is sheer mockery. The opportunity lies in your economic condition, whatever the political situation may be. No political rights can be of the least use to the man who is compelled to slave all his life to keep himself and his family from starvation. Great as the French Revolution was as a step towards emancipation from the despotism of king and noble, it could accomplish no nothing for the real freedom of man because it did not secure for him economic opportunity and independence. It is for that reason that the Russian Revolution was a far more significant event than all previous upheavals. It not only abolished the Tsar and his absolute sway, it did something more important. It destroyed the economic power of the possessing classes, of the land barons and industrial kings. For that reason, it is the greatest happening in all history, the first and only such time such a thing has been tried. This could not have been done by the French Revolution because the people then still believed that political emancipation would be enough to make men free and equal. They did not realize that the basis of all liberty is economic, but that is by no means to the discredit of the French Revolution. The times were not ripe for a fundamental economic change. Coming 128 years later, the Rus Russian Revolution was more enlightened. It went to the root of the trouble, it knew that no political freedom would do any good unless the peasants got the soil and the workers got the factories in their possession, so that they should not remain at the mercy of the land monopolists and the capitalistic owners of the industries. Of course, the Russian Revolution did not accomplish this great work overnight. Revol revolutions, like everything else, grow. They begin small, accumulate strength, develop, and broaden. It was during the war that the Russian Revolution started. Because of the dissatisfaction of the people at home and the army on the front, the country was tired of fighting. It was worn out by hunger and misery. The soldiers had enough of slaughter. They began to ask why they must kill or be killed. And when soldiers begin asking questions, no war can continue much longer. 
The despotism and corruption of the Tsarist government added oil to the fire. The court had become a public scandal, with the priest Rasputin debauching the empress, and through his influence over her, and the Tsar controlling the affairs of the state. Intrigues, bribery, and every form of venality were rampant. The army funds were stolen by high officials, and soldiers were often forced to go into battle with, without enough in, ammunition and supplies. Their boots were paper-soled, and many had no footgear at all. Some reg regiments revolted, others refused to fight. More and more frequently, the soldiers fraternized with the enemy, young men like themselves, who had the misfortune of being born in a different country, and who, like the Russians, had been ordered to war without knowing why they must shoot or be shot. Great numbers dropped their guns and returned home. There they told the folks about the fearful conditions at the front, the useless carnage, the wretchedness, and disaster. That helped to increase the discontent of the masses, and presently voices began to be heard against the Tsar and his regime. Day by day this sentiment grew. It was fanned into flame by increased taxes and great want, by the shortage of food and provisions. In February 1917, the revolution broke out. As usual in such cases, the powers that be were stricken with blindness. The autocrat and his ministers, the aristocrats and their advisors, all believed that it was just a matter of some street disorders and strikes and bread riots. They imagined themselves safe in the saddle. But the disorder continued, spreading over the entire country. And presently the Tsar saw himself forced to quit the throne. Before long, the once mighty monarch was arrested and exiled to Siberia, where he himself had formerly sent thousands to their death, and where he and his whole family later met their doom. The Russian autocracy was abolished. The February Revolution against the most powerful government in Europe was accomplished almost without firing a gun. How could it have been done so easily, you wonder? The Romanov regime was an absolutism. Russia under the Tsars was the most enslaved country in Europe. The people practically had no rights. The whim of the autocrat was supreme. The order of the police was the highest law. The masses lived in poverty and suffered the greatest oppression. They longed for freedom. For over a hundred years, libertarians and revolutionists in Russia worked to undermine the regime of tyranny, to enlighten the people, and to rouse them to revolution against their subjugation. The history of that movement is replete with the consecration and devotion of the finest men and women. Thousands, even hundreds of thousands of them, lined the road of Golgotha, filling the prisons, tortured and done to death in the frozen wilds of Siberia. Beginning with the Decembrist attempt to secure a constitution over a hundred years ago, all through the century, the fires of liberty were kept bi burning by the heroic self-sacrifice of the nihilists and revolutionists. The story of that great martyrdom has no equals in the annals of man. Apparently, it was a losing struggle, for the complete denial of freedom made it practically impossible for the pioneers of liberty to reach the people, to enlighten the masses. Tsardom was well protected by its numerous police and secret service, as well as by the church, press, and school, which trained the people in abject servility to the Tsar and unquestioning obedience to law and order. Dire punishment was visited upon anyone daring to voice a liberal sentiment. The most severe laws punished even the attempt to teach peasants to read and write. The government and the nobility, the clergy, and the bourgeoisie all combined as usual to stamp out and crush the least effort to enlighten the masses. Deprived of even the means of spreading their ideas, the liberal elements in Russia were driven to the necessity of employing violence against the barbarous tyranny, of resorting to acts of terror in order by such means to mitigate, even to a small extent, the rule of despotism. And, this, and at the same time to compel the attention of their country and the world at large to the unbearable conditions. 
It was this tragic necessity that gave rise in Russia to terroristic t activities, turning idealists, to wh whom human life was sacred, into executioners of tyrants. Nature's noblemen they were, these men and women, who willingly, even eagerly, gave their lives to lift the fearful yoke from the people. Like bright stars on the firmament of the age-long warfare between oppression and liberty, stand out the names of Sophie Perovskaya, Kibaltchik, Grinovitsky, Saznov, and countless other martyrs known and unknown of darkest Russia. It was a most uneven struggle, apparently a hopeless fight, for the revolutionists were but a handful against an almost limitless power of Tsardom, with its large armies, numerous police, special bureaus of political spies, its notorious third department, the secret Okhrana, its universal system of house janitors as police aides, and with all the great resources of a vast country of over a hundred million population. A losing fight, and yet the splendid idealism of the Russian youth particularly, of the student element, their unquenchable enthusiasm and devotion to liberty were not in vain. The people came out the victor, as they ultimately always do in the struggle of light against darkness. What a lesson to the world! What encouragement to the weakened spirit! What hope it holds for the further never-ceasing advancement of mankind in spite of all tyranny and persecution! In 1905 broke out the first revolution in Russia. Still strong was the autocracy, and the uprising of the masses was crushed though not without its having compelled the Tsar to grant certain constitutional rights. But fearfully did the government avenge even those small concessions. Hundreds of revolutionists paid for them with their lives. Thousands were imprisoned, and many others doomed Siberia. Again despotism brew a fresh breath, and felt itself secure against the people, but not for long. The hunger for liberty... May he be suppressed for a time, yet never exterminated. Man's natural instinct is for freedom, and no power on earth can succeed in crushing it for very long. Twelve years later, a very short time in the life of a people, came another, another revolution, that of February 1917. It proved that the spirit of 1905 was not dead, that the price paid for it in human lives had not been in vain. Truly it has been said that the blood of the martyrs nourishes the tree of liberty. The work and self-sacrifice self of the revolutionists had borne fruit. Russia had learned much from past experience, as succeeding events proved. The people had learned. In 1905 they had demanded only some mitigation of despotism, some small political liberties. Now they demanded the complete abolition of the tyrannical rule. The February Revolution sounded the death knell of Tsardom. It was the least bloody revolution in all history. As I have explained before, the power of even the strongest government evaporates like smoke the moment people refuse to acknowledge its authority, to bow to it, and withhold their support. The Romanov regime was conquered almost without a fight. Naturally enough, since the entire people had become tired of its rule, and had decided that it was harmful and unnecessary, and that the country would be better off without it. The ceaseless agitation and educational work carried out by the revolutionary elements, the socialists of various groups, including the anarchists, had taught the masses to understand that Tsardom must be done away with. So widespread had this sentiment become that even the army, the most unenlightened group in Russia, as in every land, had lost its faith in existing conditions. The people had outgrown the despotism, had freed themselves in mind and spirit from it, and thereby gained the strength and possibility of freeing themselves actually, physically. That is why the all-powerful autocrat could no more find support in Russia. No, not even a single regiment to protect him. The mightiest government in Europe had broke down like a house of cards. A temporary provisional government took the place of the Tsar. Russia was free. 
This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.